the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the fear you can hear. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. It gives me a fiendish delight to invite you on a very unusual expedition. For in our tale to come, we are going to travel not to distant shores, not to outer space, but instead... Backwards in time. Time as the archaeologist knows it. The depths of time. Strange thing about archaeology. It seeks to understand life by the study of death. Can we try to uncover the rest of the body, Professor? Of course. Uh, Jimmy, get the three or four fellows to help you. And, and do it carefully. There's no way of telling the body's position. Sure thing, Professor. Oh, this is awful. What are we going to do? Don't worry. Ancient bodies are your specialty. Fresh ones are mine. But how do you know it's murder? You surprise me. A suicide may dig her own grave, but you'd hardly expect her to pull the dirt in after her. Our mystery drama... Dig Me Deadly was written especially for the Mystery Theater by S.J. Wilson and stars Louise Larrabee. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. I know that death is no respecter of time. It often comes unbidden, unexpectedly, even fiercely and murderously. So, get your pith helmets, your sunglasses, your axes, shovels, and all the other paraphernalia you will need to join us in Dig Me Deadly. Young man, why aren't we on a road? Why do we have to cross the desert? Because it's the fastest way to where we're going, Detective Scrubshaw. Not Scrubshaw, Troobshaw. Troobshaw. Detective Claudia Troobshaw. And I'd bet your last toothpick, which I wish you'd take out of your mouth, that we're really crossing the Rocky Mountains. There in Colorado, this is Arizona. I know it's Arizona, Sheriff Wally. It's where I came to spend my vacation with my sister before you showed up with all your horns swoggling. Oh, ma'am, I did no such thing. Now, what else would you call it? I came here to get away from L.A. and all that smog and to breathe in the pure, fresh, clean air of Tucson. Now, thanks to you, I've got more sand in my mouth than the whole Sonora Desert. That's Mexico. This is Arizona. I've got news for you. It's left Mexico and settled in my lungs. Now, do you mean to tell me that in the entire state of Arizona, there isn't a police officer, uh, anybody who can cover this case, that you had to drag me into this no-woman's land? Those are my orders, ma'am. But why would my boss in Los Angeles assign me to an Arizona case? Well, I guess he knew you were in the neighborhood. That makes as much sense as kissing one of those cactuses. They're called saguaros. Now, stop changing the subject. Now, will you tell me where we are going? Like I said, West Anaco. Good for you. You have advanced to the next plateau. And why are we going there? Because that's where they're digging. Superb. Now, who are they? The kids that are digging. Wiley, did you ever have your IQ tested? Not so as I know. Well, don't. It's probably lower than Death Valley. And I know that's in California. Now... Why are they digging? For dead bodies, I think. Stop this car at once. 
Well, what, 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 what's wrong, Detective? Now, I'm not writing another minute until you tell me what this is all about. Well, what more do you want to know? Why I'm sitting in this rolling junk heap on my way to West Naco or wherever. Well, there are these kids there. What kids? These kids from some school near L.A. Every summer they come and they dig up things that are supposed to be real old. In other words, students working on an archaeological dig. <laughs> Never could pronounce that word. Forget the pronunciation. Just try and make some sense. Well, a few days ago I am sitting in the sheriff's office when this here girl comes by. Excuse me. Sure, miss. Come on in. Is the sheriff here? Well, the truth is, there is no sheriff. Then who's in charge? Well, I guess I am. A sort of deputy sheriff, you could say. And name, name is Wiley. I'm, I'm looking for help. That's why I'm here. What, what can I do for you? But you're not a real sheriff. Well, I don't get paid for it, but they give me the badge. <laughs> why don't you try me? I'm one of the students working at the Broadfields. The dig? Why don't you sit down? And there's some trouble there. And what, what kind of trouble? Well, that's just it. I can't tell exactly, but someone's following me. Wherever I go, I have the feeling someone right behind me or, or, or hiding and waiting to do something to me. Something terrible. Isn't there anyone in charge? Well, Professor Wilkerson, but he says I'm imagining things. Well, now, have you ever rarely seen anyone following you? No, but... Only the other day, someone went through my bureau and my luggage. Into the messing? No, but things were all messed up. Uh -huh. Now, what, what's your name? Rogers. Edith Rogers. Miss Rogers. Now, do you... you have any idea why somebody would be tailing you or looking through your things? I, I think someone's trying to kill me. Kill you? Hey, that's serious. Why would anyone want to do that? Because they're afraid of me, scared of what I could do. Why, you don't look like you could trouble a horned toad. What What are they scared of? Well, you see... No, I, I can't tell you. If they found out I came here, they'd do it faster. Anyway, you can't help me. Maybe nobody can. Wait, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait there. Then what did you do? I phoned that professor, Wilkinson. Say, say, Detective, can we get this thing going again? All right, but only as long as you tell me everything you know. Well, I, I called up that professor, and I, I told him about it. And he said that it was the girl's first summer there, and that working in the hot sun and seeing all those graves and skeletons was something she just wasn't used to. And then he said he'd take care of it and for me not to worry. Well, now, at first I thought I'd better leave well enough alone, except that the whole thing just kept a pecking at me. So, a couple of days later, I dropped by the Broadfield spread and was told by a girl who roomed with this Edith Rogers that she, that is to say, this Edith Rogers here, she had left. Did she say when? I didn't ask. Did she say how or why? No, I didn't ask that either. Were her clothes and luggage gone? Gosh, I didn't think to ask that neither. Then how come you thought to ask for me? Well, I called this friend of my father's who was assistant deputy chief of police. Say no more. You called my boss Morgan. In other words, this isn't an official assignment, is it? Well, he told me you were in Tucson and to speak to you. And dragging me through this sand heap is your idea of speaking to me. Wiley... If I admit something to you, will you promise never to tell anyone? Sure thing, Detective. I know of only one person who's a bigger fool than you. Who'd that be? Me. Uh, Detective Troopshaw? I'm Julian Wilkerson. One of the students tells me you'd like to see me. Only in an unofficial capacity, Professor. If you can be of assistance, fine. If not, I'll understand. Well, I'll try. Professor, this is Sheriff Wiley. Oh, yes, how do you do? Hi. Uh, what's it all about? The Rogers girl. I understand she's not here any longer. Yes. I knew that girl would be more trouble than it was worth to bring her out here. Then why was she here? Oh, she was thinking of archaeology as a major. You see, she apparently comes from a difficult home. She had nothing to occupy her this summer, and the dean asked me if we could fit her in. Try to make her feel she belongs to something. A group. Apparently it didn't work out. No. She moped a lot. 
got the press suspicious. Felt she wasn't wanted. I did everything I could. I got two of the nicest girls in the room with her. Uh, who are they? Oh, Jeanine Boulanger, a French exchange student, specializes in atomic physics. And uh, Susan Lathrop, a straight-A student, very outgoing, very bright. Were there um, any young men? Yes, and I didn't like doing it, but uh, I got Jimmy Trumbull to spend some of his free time with her. He's our prize. He's a brilliant fellow. We call him our Libby. Libby? Well, now, that, that's a girl's name, eh? Wiley, you're famous for not asking questions. Why not live up to your reputation? Professor Libby developed the carbon-14 dating system. Oh, he did, did he? Uh, yes. Uh, anyway, um, Edith didn't take to the work or to anyone. It's no surprise that she just dropped out. Are her um, belongings still here? Well, I wouldn't know, but uh, Susan would. Uh, she's in the specimen shed next door. Uh, let me call her. Uh, Sue? Sue Lathrop? Yes? Yes, Professor? Well, can you come to my office for a minute? Wiley, why don't you do something constructive, like seeing if you can get me something to wash down this sandstorm I swallowed? Thanks to you. Sure thing, detective. Anything special? Just something soft, wet, and cold, please. I'll be back in a minute. Oh, Sorry, miss, I didn't mean to knock. Oh, that's all right. Uh, Susan, I'd like you to meet Detective Troopshaw. A detective? From the police? Yes, but not on official business. What for, then? I was wondering if Edith Rogers' belongings were still in her room. Oh, Edith? Oh, no. Uh, she took everything when she left. When was that? Oh, about four or maybe five days ago. I I'm not sure. Do you have any idea why she left? Not really. She... She didn't tell anyone she was going, but then she just didn't get... Well, what can I say? Susan's trying to be discreet. The fact is the girl just didn't belong. Did anyone notify her family? I know I didn't. We just assumed that she hitchhiked her way home, or perhaps to one of the youth communes around here. Then, at this point, we don't know if she left or disappeared. But what would make you think she disappeared? She went for help to what's supposed to be the local sheriff's office. She was frightened, thought she was being followed, that someone wanted to kill her. That's just like her. She was so silly, so romantic, always making up stories where so-and-so loved her madly and so-and-so was terribly jealous of her. And, of course, she was always at the top of the trying. Uh, uh, I suppose we could phone her home and see if she got there. You fool! You what? stupid idiot fool! Don't you ring well, the phone? no call to get yourself all heated up. It's just an old hour ahead. The sign says radioactive area. Do not enter. Sounds like Wiley tried to get me a bottle of atomic soda pop. Oh, that's Shanine. Let's uh, see what the fuss is about. Now what, Wiley? Well, it beats me. I just picked up this here arrowhead in that shed, and she comes down on me like an eagle on a stray lamb. That is not an arrowhead, young fella. It's a spear point that happens to be about 12,000 years old. Trouble is, it's recently been through carbon-14 dating. That? Yes, and it may still be hot. Like an atom bomb? Hopefully, Wiley, you'll go up in a mushroom any minute. Well, Professor, I am so sorry. Oh, no. Well, I just give that arrowhead to Janine. She's wearing protective gloves. And then follow her. She'll take you to the decontamination room. You'll probably be all right. Don't look so worried, Wiley. There's no chance of it affecting your brains. You sure not, Detective? Absolutely. Follow me, you goose, quickly. So that stone point is 12,000 years old. Yes. Uh, well, that's as close as we can get uh, within the margins given by C-14, but... Uh, Jimmy is now working with radioactive potassium, which can give us an earlier reading. <laughs> I thought 10,000 to 15,000 was about the earliest records we have of men on this continent. Well, <laughs> we've got some surprises in store. Not only for you, Detective, but for the world. Really? Care to give me a clue? I already have. I filed that one away. Which one? With C-14, you can date back some 50,000 years, but with potassium, you can go back to at least one million years, right? Yes, that was the clue. Interesting. What are you hoping for? It's no longer a hope, Detective. But uh, you'll have to be patient and uh, wait until we release our reports. <laughs> What's that all about? I don't know. The kids seem to be heading for the northwestern bridge. I've got to go. I'll bet it's Wiley again. Nothing like this has happened before. Nothing like Wiley has happened Susan? before. Susan? 
Susan, do you know what's happening? No, Professor, but it's something exciting. Maybe a new find. I hope they didn't have to dig as much sand as I've got in my shoes. I'll catch up with Hi, you. Hi, Detective, aren't you coming? Someone scream. Wiley, where have you been? I've been in that shed with that French refrigerator. I need your shoulder. Well, what for? To lean on so I can get the Sahara out of my shoes. Okay, but you better hurry. Wiley, Hmm. no matter what has happened up there, you've got to do something for me. What's that? In that shed, can you remember what you saw there? Pretty much. Then listen carefully. Oh, bon Dieu, it's a woman's hand. And I know whose it is. By the ring, the silver band. Well, whose is it? Edith Rogers. Oh. All right, no, no one touch anything until Detective Troopshaw gets here. A detective? Oh, a lady detective. detective get in here. Okay, kids, one detective coming up. Let, oh. let me through. Right. The detective. Yes, 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 yes. Let the detective through, please. Well, from the looks of it, here's a lady who definitely needs a hand. Who found her? I did. And who are you? James Trumbull. I told you about him, remember? Oh, yes. You're Libby, as you call him. Yes. But uh, there doesn't seem to be any digging around here. Is this the way you found her? Just one hand sticking out of the sand? No. I was on my way to the datum point to figure out what the next grid would be when I passed this place and noticed that someone had been digging around here. The sand wasn't as flat as the surrounding area and not as compact. So I began to brush away the top layer... Until I uncovered this one hand. Professor, have I your permission to supervise this matter until I get official regulations? Yes, of course. Thanks. Has anyone been able to identify the hand? Susan, she said it is Edith Rogers. What makes you think that? The silver band. I was with her when she bought it in town a couple of weeks ago. She bought a silver wedding band? I asked her why, and she said she expected to be married very soon. It just sounded like one of her crazy stories, so so I forgot about it. I see. Well, rings have been known to change fingers. Can we try and uncover the rest of the body? Of course. Uh, Jimmy, get three or four fellows to help you. I, I do it carefully, please. There's no way of telling the body's position. Sure thing, Professor. Oh, this is awful. What are we going to do? Don't worry, Professor. Ancient bodies are your specialty. Fresh ones are mine. Yes, but this is liable to stop our work. This place will be crawling with police, newsmen, television crews, what all. Really? Why? Isn't murder a little too common to rate that kind of attention? But how do you know it is murder? Miss Lathrop, you surprise me. A suicide may dig her own grave, but you'd hardly expect her to pull the dirt in after her. The pit's very shallow, Professor. I don't think we should use shovels. Shall we use the brushes from here? Sure, but uh, let's get a move on, eh? Ah! Look, look, the hand is attached only to bones, mm. to a skeleton. Oh, no, I've never seen it. Oh, now, now, will you all stop crowding? You'd think this was a Hollywood opening. Oh, Janine is right. There is no body. The hands are attached to a skeleton. <laughs> fleshed hands attached to a body that is nothing more than bones, a skeleton. You know, Mother Earth is very miserly about giving up her secrets, but little by little, man has dug them out of her. But never before has there been this kind of puzzle in which the hands belong to the present and the body to the past. We'll be back shortly with Act Two. We return to our dilemma. The question is, what is a bunch of young, bright college students going to do about a body that has fully fleshed hands attached to the bones of a skeleton? And what is our lady detective, Claudia Troopshaw, going to do with this seemingly improbable corpse? Yes, Captain. You've got to tell me under whose jurisdiction this case belongs. No, there is no local police department. The hands may be the Roger girls, but the body... Well, you get this. It's a skeleton, and the professor tells me it's over two and a half thousand years old. 
Stop yelling. I know it sounds crazy, but they just did a C-14 test on one of the bones. And that's the result. Two and a half thousand years old. But not the hands. Whose case is it, I want to know? Mine? Why mine? Well, will you get in touch with the FBI at once? No, I can't use anyone here to help me that's already here. Why not? Because they're all under suspicion. That's why not. Lunkhead. It's nice of you, Miss Boulanger, to take time off to have this little talk with me. Professor Wilkerson said I should answer all your questions to the best that I can. Do you always do what Professor Wilkerson asks? Oh, yes. He is a marvelous man. He is uh, so brilliant. I'm sure. Tell me, do you have many friends among the other students? I don't think so. Not even Jimmy Trumbull? Oh, he is nice, but uh, he is such a little boy. And the others? I am afraid they're all too jealous. (laughs) Do you know why? Oh, they think that the professor treats me like a favorite. Well, does he? Of course not. But uh, I have studied all of this and done it in France before, so I know it very well. And they do not. I think I understand. This body we found, you've seen it? I could not bear to look. Oh, but you did. Now tell me, in all your work, both here and in France, have you ever seen anything like it? No, absolutely not. And you couldn't explain how two perfectly fleshed hands could be attached to a prehistoric skeleton? It's against all possibilities. What... What did you think of Edith Rogers? She was very unfortunate. In what way? Oh, she so badly needed some kind of an attachment. With a boy, I mean. And I think she almost found it. But then that Susan Lathrop got in the way and kept it from happening. How do you mean? Oh, I don't like talking gossip. But Edith Rogers liked very much this Jimmy Trumbull... But that Susan, who blows hot one day and cold the next, makes up her mind that Jimmy is her property. And she says to that Roger's girl, she should stay off her property. Anything else, Janine? No. That is all. Thank you. You've been very helpful. Come on in. Oh, hello, Jimmy. Hello, Detective Troopshaw. Professor Wilkinson says you want to see me. I have just a few questions that may or may not help clear up some of your problems. My problems? No, not yours personally, but the outfits. But, but where's the problem? Well, if those hands belong to Edith Rogers, it means she's dead. And that, I'd call a problem. This whole thing's crazy. It's some kind of gag. I mean, it's not possible for a skeleton of someone who's been dead for over 2,000 years to have the hands of someone who was alive a week ago or less. Did you see Edith Rogers about a week ago? Yes, ma'am. I understood you were one of the very few who was sort of interested in Edith Rogers. Well, I was sorry for her. She was lonely and frightened. Did any of the others talk to you about her? No, but Edith had a lot to say about us. Can you give me some idea? Edith thought Susan was a fake, that Janine was phony, and the rest of us pretty silly digging away in over 100 degrees temperature. She just didn't understand why we were doing it. Didn't that make you wonder what she was doing here? Oh, sure. But she was lonely, and and she would have done anything to be anywhere. Oh, say, I almost forgot. Something funny happened this morning, and I meant to tell you about it, but with all the rumors and gossip, well, it just slipped my mind. What was it? On my way to the grid we're working on, I ran into this Indian. A really strange guy. He was dressed in some weird Mexican costume and had long drooping mustaches. And he asked me in this queer accent if I knew where Minnehaha was buried. Minnehaha? Was he kidding? Who knows? When I told him I didn't know, he became very sad. And he said his name was Tepexpan. And that his wife had died 10,000 years ago. Tepexpan, no less. The name's sort of familiar. Oh, come on, Jimmy. Even I know that for years the Tepexpan man was considered the earliest specimen of man found in the United States. Oh, of course. What else did he say? Now, let's see. Oh, I, I, I wrote it down here. Here it is. He said, 
She who seeks shall find the answers in her mind if she can find the man that is called to Pexpan. You're putting me on. No, I'm not, honestly. And then he said that she would find the star of Tepexpan in the south of Tuxpan. Can I have that paper, Jimmy? Of course. Thanks. Tepexpan, my foot. Wiley must be a genius to be able to drive this kidney buster. I can just about manage to keep the wheels straight. Now, where am I? Tuxpan, Tuxpan. Ah, here it is, Tuxpan Avenue. Now turn south. How am I supposed to find the building? The star of Tuxpan. Ah, lo and behold, a building with a star over the door. Squaw. I'll fix that one's TP. I was told you've been to the ancient burial ground. You have been told well. I go to see my wife. Is she one of the workers at the day? Oh, no. She toils no more. Your people toil for her. Hit me with that one again. She has been dead for over 10,000 years. I thought it was 2,500. Ah, but what's a few years in a romance that's lasted that long, right? Her spirit gives me many answers to my prayers. Do the answers to mine happen to be among them? Well, if you open the pouch, I will place a magic message within. Gracias, senor. It is but the will of the gods that I obey. Incidentally, senor Tepexpan, the next time you speak to the spirits of the gods, find out the name in Indian for fruitcake. As Asia Squaw commands. And take that silly toothpick out of your face. Who's there? Shirley Holmes. Who? Oh, it's you, Detective. I was just being cute, Miss Lathrop. Shirley, Sherlock Holmes, get it? <laughs> What's there to get cute about? I see you're packing. I'm leaving. I'm sorry, Miss Lathrop, but you're not going anywhere. Why not? Because everyone stays put until I get the answers to a thing or two. Such as? If the body we found yesterday was Edith Rogers... I told you it has to be Edith. They are her hands. Attached to a prehistoric skeleton. I don't care what the radiocarbon dating says. I was with her when she bought that wedding band. She didn't say anything about when she planned to get married. No. And uh, you didn't ask? I thought she was clowning. So she impressed you as the sort of person who would clown about getting married? I guess she wasn't old-fashioned enough to be serious about it. But most of the girls here aren't into things like getting married. We don't have such hang-ups. And uh, Edith Rogers was a square. Very square. You must have found it a bore to room with her. Frankly, she was a bit of a drag. How did Janine get along with her? They hardly spoke to each other. Because of Wilkerson? How did you know? Do you think either of them got anywhere with him? Janine was making points. Not that she's so hot. But her father's an important politician in France. And Wilkerson is impressed by that sort of thing. Ambitious, eh? Even at his age. Oh, come on, Miss Lathrop. He's not that old. Old enough to have a son who's in college. As a matter of fact, it was good old Edith Rogers who told me that. Did she tell you anything else? Nothing important. Have you ever seen anything like that body before? Never. Think hard. Maybe an experiment done on an animal in a lab or in the dating shed? No. Besides, I'm not allowed in the shed. Why not? I don't get to work on dating until next term. Oh, I guess I'll have to take my own advanced course with Professor Wilkerson. Oh! 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 That's Janine! I was waiting for the second moccasin to drop. Let's go. It is written in the book of Proverbs, and wisely, I believe... Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein. Our problem is that 
All our characters are diggers in pits. Even our ardent detective, Claudia Trubshaw, has been digging through level after level, but getting seemingly nowhere. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Do you realize that the gunshot we heard at the end of the second act was the first time anyone has used a conventional weapon in our story? Well, gunshots may not only be used to signify someone's end, they may also be fired to start something. Isn't that typical of a woman? She calls for help but doesn't bother to tell where she needs it. It sounded far away. Maybe from the northern grid section. You mean where the body was found? Yes. What could anyone be doing out there? Looking for clues? Or maybe hiding Well, something. why didn't I think of that? Oh. I don't know. I heard this didn't go on. There's our man. You mean Professor Wilkerson? Yes. Hey, Professor. There, Detective. Over here. There he is. He turned on his flash. Professor, hold it a minute. Let me catch my breath. Did you hear Janine call? No, I was covering grid S-42. We were working late there. Are you sure it was Janine? Pretty much, unless someone's imitating her accent. But we don't know from where she called. I think it came from that north grid. First we heard what may have been a gunshot, and then we heard La Belle Janine calling for help. Hey, has everyone around here gone banana? They say they heard a gunshot. Detective Troopshaw says Janine cried for help. And where were you, Mr. Trumbull? In the barracks, doing some research. Well, anyway, the detective thinks that Janine is locked in somewhere. Well, how about the lab shed? I think you're in the tank. Come on. Uh, who has the key to the shed? I do, but uh, you'll have to wait out here. What for? I'll have to go in first to check on possible radioactivity inside. Uh, just one second, Professor. Janine? Janine, are you in there? Yes, I am. I am. Is it safe for us to come in? Yes, it is very safe. All right, I've got my key here. on Oh, Professor. Oh, oh. That girl faints easier than I can think. Janine. Janine, are you all right? Don't ask her. She'll say no. Get her back inside. Now, for the rest of you, please, stay out here. Don't go anywhere. Anyone. Still planning to leave, Susan? She wouldn't let me. Besides... What difference would it make to you if I did? I'm just being friendly. Isn't it a little too late? What do you mean? Well, now that Edith Rogers is dead, do you think I'd be waiting around to catch you on the rebound? Oh, look, I was just being kind to her. Kind? Isn't there a phrase about someone being killed with kindness? What are you getting at? Now listen, James Trumbull. Because Edith Rogers was a fool doesn't mean all girls are... No one ever said you were. Look, the only reason I took her out a couple of times was because the professor asked me to. Well, aren't you the obedient student? What professors say, Jimmy, do. I don't know how else I can convince you. You can't. And if I were you, I wouldn't try. Look, you can count on my being fair and keeping quiet. Uh, I'm not out for revenge. But I'm also not about to stick my neck out for anyone, including you. I still don't know what you're getting at. I'm getting at who killed Edith Rogers. I don't know why it is, Professor, but I've never seen a woman in a faint whose legs didn't look lousy. Oh, what happened? That did it. It always does. Janine... Janine. I don't want to interrupt, but uh, like a good archaeologist, would someone please get to the bones of the matter? I am speaking as fast as I know. I, I heard a noise at the window. What kind of noise? The window was opening. Wasn't it locked? It's always locked. So I, I went to see what could be happening, and already there was this man climbing inside. What was it like? He was an old Indian man with long mustaches. I told him to get out, that it was dangerous to be here. And then? He would not say anything, but stood there. So I ran back to the lab room where I have my pistol. And when I returned, I found him in the specimen room. He had a leather bag tied around his waist. It was open. Did you see him put anything in it? No. But I held up the pistol and told him I would shoot if he didn't put back whatever he took. So he put his hand in the bag and took something out and threw it in my eyes. Then I pressed the pistol... What did he throw? Little things. Uh, I don't know. Well, let's take a look. All right. Now, wait, wait, wait. Here on the floor. It's thin slivers. 
It's maybe wood. Let's take a closer look. No, no, look. no, 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 don't touch them. For heaven's sakes, why not? They may be hot. I'll get the counter. Is anything missing, Miss Boulanger? I have not looked. Well, do that little thing. And, um, Miss Boulanger, the next time you find that you're stuck in here, just open the lock and walk out. <laughs> Okay, folks, time has come to stop playing games. What kind of games? The game where one hand washes the other. Now, since you've got seniority, Professor, we'll start with you. What kind of a game could I possibly be playing? Well, as a professor, you're a great show. As a poker player, you're stupid. Oh, really? You don't know how to bluff. Remember how you insisted that spear point Wiley took from the shed had to be radioactive? Well, you were lying. How dare you? When it comes to the truth, Professor, I'm very daring. That spear point was in perfect condition. If it had been dated, a piece of it would have had to be missing. How could you know that? What do you think they teach us at the police academy? Home economics? Now, putting it simply, the less carbon-14 in an object, the older it is, right? Right. That is correct. And the older, the more valuable. Sure, that's what we're here for. To find evidence leading back to the first human being in America. And when you can't find it? Well, then you can fake it, can't you? What do you mean, detective? There's no dating equipment in that shed. You are preposterous. Wait till you hear how preposterous I really am. Only two people have been allowed in that shed. You and Miss Boulanger. Yes, those are the rules. Well, a certain friend of mine broke those rules. Senor Tepexpan, if you please. Hey! How about that? Now, if you'll just get rid of those tired handlebars from under your nose. Glad to. They sure itch. Why, the one? The sheriff. The one who asked me questions about Edith. Right. And he got into that shed not to take things, but to return them. Didn't you, Wiley? I sure did. But, uh, what did you take that had to be put back? That old spear point and a nozzle on that machine. The head? The bombarding head? And I took them both to Tucson to have the experts there take a look at them. And they confirmed my best suspicions. Professor Wilkerson, you and Miss Boulanger were faking your specimens, making them older. That's one accusation I won't buy. You can always return it for credit when I open that department. Meanwhile, you were bombarding those specimens repeatedly, trying to get them to date more than 50,000 years. Professor, did you do that? I just can't believe it. Why not, Trumbull? You invented the machine. Well, only by accident. It was a fluke. And you told your esteemed professor about that fluke, and he told you to keep it under wraps. Yes, I did keep it under wraps. I never wrote a paper. Well, how did they know about it in Tucson? Well, I sent them a report, but, but only for their opinion. Trumbull, you're a damn fool. You know, Professor, you're just plain not nice. Here we girls spend fortunes trying to keep young while you try to make a fortune aging us. Which uh, brings me to Edith Rogers. Of those present... Only Wilkerson, Trumbull, and Miss Boulanger knew how to operate that machine. Oh, no, wait, no, wait, no, wait, no, wait, they wait, ought wait, to be wait, arrested wait. at once. You'd like that, Miss Lathrop, wouldn't you? It leaves your hands clean, so to speak. Now, listen, Detective, I had no reason... Getting her pregnant and being blackmailed to marry her isn't a reason? Come off, Professor. He did? The Professor? Surprised, aren't you, Miss Lathrop? But why... Why would I want to hurt that Edith Rogers? You knew she had something on the professor, else she wouldn't have been here. But when you heard about the wedding ring, you thought you just might lose not only your professor, but more importantly, that machine. I I'm sorry, what's going on here? I'm all lost. So am I, Trumbull, when it comes to you. I can't figure what you had to do with all this. Well, he may not be that innocent. He did try and make time with Edith Rogers until she dumped him. Well, that's not true, Susan. You're calling me a liar? I think you and your two pals are all to blame for that girl's death. You all deserve to be murdered. And this time, Miss Lathrop, you'd do it properly, wouldn't you? What are you talking about? Trumbull, did you ever tell Susan here about the machine? 
Well, yes, sort of, but not how to work it. I, I hadn't finished it then. But she was smart enough to know how it could be used. And you're just guessing. True. But then came the monkey wrench. Trumbull began dating Edith Rogers. I didn't care. Not until she bought that wedding band. Now, why would that girl buy her own ring? You know why. Because no woman would go to a doctor for that kind of an examination without the necessary decoration on her finger. What's that to do with me? While Janine thought it was the professor, you thought it was Jimmy Trumbull who might be the father. First, you threatened Edith Rogers. But when Jimmy tried seeing her again, you took no chances of ever losing that machine, and you just removed her from the sea. You're crazy. Not crazy enough to use a machine I knew nothing about, because that's what you did. You know, your biggest mistake was in tying Edith Rogers' hands over her head before opening that machine full blast. Those hands were protected by the lead shield over her head. Of course. Only the lead shield could have saved those hands, kept them from dating back. The result? A 2,500-year-old skeleton with Edith Rogers' hands. Okay, detective. Who saw me? Where's your proof? Yours were the only fingerprints found on the bombarding head Wiley took to Tucson. Susan, you didn't work that machine without gloves, without protection. Why? What's wrong with that? Oh, good Lord. You didn't. What are you saying? Oh, no. Your body's probably got more than 600 radioactive units in it right now. You're... you're trying to scare me. It's not true. Susan, 400 units are fatal. Help me. Someone help me. Or I die. Help me. Obviously, Miss Susan Lathrop got a dose of the same medicine she gave Edith Rogers. Except in her case, its effects will be much slower and very much more painful. Sad. Very sad. But it will save the state a great deal of money. I'll be back shortly. Here's a little thought to take to sleep with you. Never indulge in excesses. Eat moderately, drink moderately, and murder moderately. Our cast included Louise Larrabee, Mason Adams, Ralph Bell, Corrine Orr, Anne Costello, and Christopher Tabori. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Accidents happen every day. A foot may slip, a tile could fall, and the only guilty party would be the wind. How, Laurel? How? Trust me, my angel. I shall find a way. <coughs> Did you hear anything? Outside the door. It sounded like Madame's cat, Francois. How could that be? He may have followed me here. Shh, shh. No, quiet, quiet. Nobody. It's not a thing. It was only in our imagination. But why should we have both imagined the voice of Francois at the very same moment? Oh, hold me close, Laurent. I'm very afraid. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams? <laughs>